that again. Good morning, everybody. Kingdom people. We're having a good time in West Virginia. Almost heaven. I know you get tired of hearing that, but I still had to do it. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 48. Nathaniel asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. My sermon today is called Subficus. That's Latin for under the fig tree. Subficus, under the fig tree. So after Jesus was baptized, he began to gather his disciples. One of the first that he called was Philip. Philip was from Bethsaida, a fishing village on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Philip then went and found Nathanael. Nathanael was from Cana. Cana is just about three miles from Nazareth. And Philip said to Nathanael, We have found the one that Moses and the prophets spoke of. We've found the one we've been waiting for. Nathanael said, Well, who is it? Philip said, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Well, she's down the road from Cana. I know Nazareth. Nazareth? You sure it's Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's nowhere, man. Nothing ever comes out of there. Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip just said, Come and see. And so Philip brings Nathanael to Jesus. And as Jesus sees Nathanael coming to him, he says, Oh, look at that. An Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. You're not, you're not playing deceptive games. You are what you are. An Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Nathaniel said, okay. How would you get to know me? We've never met. How, how do you know me? Oh, before Philip called you, I saw you, Subficus. I saw you under the fig tree. Rabbi. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Because I said I saw you under the fig tree? Oh, you're going to see better things than that. You're going to see the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I love this story. And we have to maybe wonder, though, how is it that Nathaniel is able to make this astounding confession of faith? Rabbi, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, the King of Israel. All because Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. What's going on here? Well, we got to talk about fig trees. Fig trees show up uh, more than 40 times in the Bible. And they're, uh, they're a good tree. They're a good tree for lots of reasons, but they're a good tree. Do you remember Gideon? You all remember Gideon? Yeah, maybe some Sunday school lessons about Gideon. Well, Gideon had 70 sons. That's a lot. And um, <laughs> Gideon was one of the judges of Israel. This is before the monarchy. 
And after Gideon's death, one of these sons, Abimelech, decided that he wanted to be king. He wanted to reign and rule over all of Israel. They didn't have a king at this time. This is before the monarchy. But Abimelech got it in his head. I want to be king. And so you know what he did? He gathered together some of the rabble, some that would follow him, and Abimelech murdered his brothers. Yeah, there's, there's some awful stuff in the Bible. He murdered all of his brothers, except one escaped. Jotham escaped. Murdered all of his brothers, but one. And this one, Jotham, he escaped, and he went up on to the top of Mount Gerizim. And he spoke to the elders of Israel, and he gave this parable. The trees once went out to anoint a king over themselves. So they said to the olive tree, reign over us. The olive tree answered them, Shall I stop producing my rich oil by which gods and mortals are honored and go to sway over the trees? Then the trees said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. But the fig tree answered them, Shall I stop producing my sweetness and my delicious fruit and go to sway over the trees? Then the trees said to the vine, You come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, Shall I stop producing my wine that cheers gods and mortals and go to sway over the trees? So all the trees said to the bramble, the thorn tree, you come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, hmm, if you really mean it, if in good faith you are anointing me king over you, then come and take refuge in my shame, in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Well, the lesson to learn there is beware of those too eager to have power, to have dominion, those that only want to sway over everybody else. The olive tree says, you know, my goodness is to give the oil. The fig tree says, my goodness is to give the fruit. The vine says, my goodness is to give the wine. The bramble said, I want power. I want to reign. I want to rule. And if anyone gets in my way, I'm willing to burn the whole forest down. Well, I come to this passage because I want you to know, fig tree is a good tree. It produces this sweetness of fruit. Throughout the prophets, we find this poetic idiom for the life of Shalom, everyone will sit under his vine and his fig tree. This is the, uh, this is the aspirational idiom for life during the reign of Messiah. When Messiah comes, everyone will sit beneath his vine and his fig tree. It's really way of, a way of saying, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Well, we'll just sit under our vine and under our fig tree. It's an aspirational, poetic idiom for the arrival of the shalom of God. Furthermore, rabbis were known to teach their disciples under the leafy shade of a fig tree. That became a thing. Rabbi, because they're, they're, they're good shade trees. I, I do remember. I, I was... One day in Israel, had a day off from doing what I was doing there. And I just, I spent the day under a fig tree with my Bible, with the Lord. I was in your presence for an hour or so, or was it a day? I truly don't know. Where the sun never set and the trees hung low near that soft and shining sea. So the fig tree became 
associated metaphorically with sitting with your rabbi, sitting at the feet of your teacher, and sitting in the presence of the Lord, associated with all of these sorts of prophetic longings for the arrival of the kingdom of Messiah. So Nathaniel was under the fig tree. Was he praying? I mean, it's, it's, it's a sight associated with prayer, meditation, contemplation. I think of it like Nathaniel's under the fig tree and he's praying, Oh, Lord, how long? How long? The prophets had said, God, that you would come, that you would send your anointed one. Oh, Lord, how long? How much longer do we have to wait? It's been so long since Moses and the prophets spoke of the one that would come. Oh, Lord, how long? Ten minutes later, Jesus of Nazareth says, I saw you under the fig tree. How could you see me under the fig tree? I was all alone. I was all by myself. You saw, I saw you under the fig tree. Rabbi, you're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one we've been hoping for. You're the one that I was yearning for. Rabbi, you're the son of God, the king of Israel. Oh, you're going to see more than that, Nathaniel. You're going to see the angels of heaven ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Subphicus under the fig tree. What Christian mystics throughout history have described as contemplative prayer, I like to describe as simply sitting with Jesus. Sitting with... I, 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 I sit... With Jesus, that's what it is. <laughs> I sit, I acknowledge the presence of the Lord. Christ above me, very God, a very God. Christ below me, incarnate of the earth. Christ before me when seen, Christ behind me when unseen. Christ at my right hand in my strength, Christ at my left in my weakness. Christ all around me, filling all things everywhere with Himself. Christ within me, formed by faith. I acknowledge your presence and then I sit with Jesus. And I allow His presence that is salvation to just wash over me. Subphicus prayer. Under the fig tree prayer. Just acknowledging the presence of the Lord and sitting with Him. Sitting with Jesus. Maybe that's sitting under the fig tree. It's mostly prayer without words. It's just sitting silently, meditating, contemplating, waiting, listening. My fig tree, well, I have several fig trees. Come on now, work with me. This metaphor here. These are the places I like to pray. The hickory rocker by the wood stove in the winter in the basement, that's a good fig tree. I have places in my study and at church in the prayer room, fig tree. But my best fig tree is, actually is a tree. It's not a fig tree, it's a sycamore tree. An enormous centuries old American sycamore tree. Those trees can live to be five or six hundred years old. This one might be three or four hundred years old. It's enormous. And of all the places to sit under the fig tree and be in the presence of the Lord, that's my favorite. The enormous sycamore is older than internal combustion. Quieter too. I call it my sycamore tree, which is funny because it more rightly calls me its human being. I've seen it get sick and I've seen it get well. It's a tough old tree. Once in an ice storm, it impaled the ground with a spear. Zeus could not have done it better. It's not a tree to be trifled with. It watched Missouri hunt deer before there were houses here. Now it watches me read and write books. The Missouri were more interesting. For two decades, it stood guard while I thought and thought and thought and found a better way to think about God. And the tree thinks I'm not as daft as I used to be. We hung a porch swing from its mightiest bough. Sycamore doesn't mind. 
It's my favorite place to pray. I think my prayers helped heal it once. And the sycamore prayers have healed me more than once. When we sit under the fig tree with Jesus, we may not see Jesus, but Jesus sees us. I saw you under the fig tree. The moment you sit with intentionality and say, Jesus, I acknowledge you. Risen and reigning Lord, I acknowledge you, the one who now fills everything, everywhere, with your own presence. I acknowledge you. The moment you, Jesus sees you, you may not see him, he sees you. And I think of it as giving Jesus permission to go to work on me. Because I, because I, am, I am seen by him. His disposition toward me is nothing but unconditional, unending love. But he sees my weaknesses. He sees my spiritual pathologies. And so I sit with him and invite him to go to work on me. To sit with Jesus in openness and honesty is to sit under the fig tree, just to be open. It's the only real cure for self-deception, just to sit and not try to hide. You don't hide. The fig trees are not for hiding. The fig leaves are not for hiding. Therefore, it's a place to be open before Jesus. Nathaniel was remarked upon by Jesus as a man without guile. He's not trying to deceive anybody. He's not trying to pass himself off as something that he's not. And of course, the person we're most likely to deceive is our own self. You know, the practice of self-deception is one of the things that keeps us from making any real spiritual progress. So to sit under the fig tree, subficus, to sit in the presence of the Lord is a yearning just to be open before God. To be open to God. Oh, to be open. Oh, to be open. It's what the wise ones seek. It's what the great souls attain. What's a saint? An open one. St. Francis and Mother Teresa were open. Open to God. Open to creation. Open to the other. We're all born open. Wide-eyed and wide open. What's an infant? An open one. Wonder, learning, and love come easy to a child. But then we suffer the blows and begin to close. By the time we're a teen, we're mostly tight shut. Happy or sad, a clam inside a shell. Now the task begins, the task of a lifetime, the task of becoming open. Oh, to be open, an old one open again. Open to wonder, learning, and love. To grow open is to grow young. Much is against openness. Vested interests stake much in keeping us tight shut. The talking heads of the tight shut tell us of right and wrong, black and white, red and blue, us and them, who is out and who is in. Their words are a slamming door, bam, tight shut. To live in the world of the tight shut is called certainty and security, clarity and conformity. It's also death. To live there is to shrivel your soul, to die there. Well, I don't know. I do know that to save my soul, I must become open. Open to God's all-encompassing love. I cannot afford to slam the door. To shut the door on them is to lock myself in hell's closet. Oh, to be open. Where does the first crack of openness come from? It could come from anywhere. A poem, a heartbreak, a sunset really seen, a song, a sermon, a mercy freely received, a birth, a death, a person fully loved. Let openness get its foot in the door and it'll begin to shovel the grace in. Open to the openness. The openness of God. The openness of light. The openness of love. Life is open, ever unfolding. 
Death is closed, a sealed tomb. Heaven is open, its gates will never be shut. Hell is closed, abandon all hope ye who enter. Jesus is the usher of openness. He holds the keys of hell and death to set its prisoners free. May he loose and lead us into the great openness of God. Oh, to be open. Aurelius Augustus. He was born in the Roman Empire, North Africa, in the year 354. He had a Christian mother and a pagan father. Augustine was gifted with a brilliant intellect, one of the great minds in all of Western history. He began teaching rhetoric in Milan and began to be known by the emperor. As a young man in his 20s, he became the speechwriter for the Roman emperor. He's climbing the ladder. He's gaining wealth and fame. He's attaining success and status. He also lives a debauched life. Kind of wine, women's song, party life. He knows that's not good for him. He wants to break away from it, but he finds like he finds that he just can't. There's chains on him, and he, he can't rise up to a more noble existence. Aurelius Augustine. When he was 31 years old, he has a life, he has the world by the tail, and he's enormously successful and wealthy and but, but he's, he has these chains of bondage and he can't seem to rise up above the flesh and have a more noble life. When he was 31 years old, four of his friends that were also in the imperial court, that were also movers and shakers, that were also in the imperial administration, four of his friends became Christians. And this just shocked him. He, he was shocked that, that four of his friends had left this life to follow Jesus. And it led him to begin to re-examine his life. One day he's sitting in his house. And his friend Alypius comes over. And they were playing some kind of board game, probably backgammon. It's been around a long time. Really. They're sitting at this, at this board game. And Augustine just said, What's wrong with us? And he names their four friends. They said, I think they've done the right thing. But here we sit, stuck. We can't change. What's wrong with us? And he begins to cry and he's embarrassed. So he, he leaves his house and he goes into his garden. He goes into his garden and now he's really weeping. And he flings himself under a fig tree. Yes, he flings himself onto the ground under a fig tree. And he begins to pray. And he just prays, Oh God, how long? How long do I have to be like this? Why can't I change? How long is this going to go on like this? Oh God, how long? Under the fig tree, Augustine crying out to God. How long? And then, on the other side of the wall, he hears the voice of a child. In a sing-song voice saying, Tole lege, tole lege, tole lege, tole lege, tole lege. It means take and read, take and read, take and read, take and read. And he started thinking, are, are, there, are there any children's songs that say, Tole lege, take and read? He couldn't think of any. The voice just kept saying, Tole lege, tole lege, take and read, take and read. And he decided... This was the answer to his prayer. That God was speaking to him through the voice of this child. And so he gets up from under the fig tree, walks back into his house. The voice had said, take and read. He's a scholar. His life is filled with books. He picks up the first book he finds. It happens to be a copy of Paul's epistle to the Romans. He opens it at random. This, opens, this works once in life. Opens it at random. Points his finger and reads, 
Let us live honorably as in the day, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in debauchery and immorality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And he went to Olypius and he pointed and says, I'm doing this right now. I'm becoming a Christian. And he did. Very quickly, he became a pastor, a bishop, ultimately one of the most important theologians in the history of the church. All because he was open to God under the fig tree. You know, we need more leaders who are open to God under the fig tree. May the Lord grace his church to be led by those that are open under the fig tree. You don't know me. I've been the pastor of one congregation, one church... For 41 years. Started off small, stayed mall, small for seven years, and then phew, exploded thousands of people. Through the 90s, I mean, every Sunday was like record attendance, more and more and more and more people. But I began to feel discontent. I wasn't dissatisfied with Jesus, but I just felt like Jesus deserved a better Christianity than I knew. By all the metrics that Americans like to measure success, we had it made. But I felt like it was cheap, shallow, thin, too consumerist, too American. And I didn't know what to do. So I said, well, I'll just back up as far as I know how to back up and, and start over again. And so I started reading the church fathers, these early Christian theologians. One day, it was June 4th, 2000. Exactly 23 years ago today. Exactly 23 years ago. And June 4th was a Sunday. I'd preached, you know, services. And I was sitting on my front step reading Augustine's Confessions. I'm just reading this book. And about halfway through, I was just overwhelmed by the devotion of this one man to know God is revealed in Christ. And I closed the book, and I prayed. From, I prayed with all the honesty I could. I said, God, in this moment, I mean this as much as I possibly can, I want to give the rest of my life to knowing you as you are revealed in Jesus Christ. I don't want to be a success. I want to know you as you are revealed in Jesus Christ. I pray this prayer right now. Amen. And as soon as I said amen, I began to have this strange... Spiritual experience. I, I wanted to speak some particular words. I didn't understand them necessarily. And I could, I could not not speak them. I had to say, come with me. Come with me. Come with me and you won't get cheated. We're going to a better place. Come with me. And so I started saying that. I said that to my church. I still didn't really know what I meant, but I said, come with me. We're beginning a journey. We're beginning a pilgrimage. We've been here. It's been okay, but there's somewhere better. I don't know exactly where it is, but come with me. And it was really the beginning of the second half of my life. I remember telling the church in August of that year, I'm packing my bags from the charismatic movement. There's something better. I'm going on. Come with me. And I did it with enough rhetorical skill that they all applauded until I actually did it. And then, then they weren't all so excited. It's been a long journey. It's been a hard journey, but it's been worth it. So sit under the fig tree. First, find your fig tree. It's there. It might be your backyard, it might be a park, it might be somewhere in your house, it might be in your living room, I don't know where it is. But there's a fig tree out there for you. Find it and sit there. Just acknowledge Jesus, say, I know you see me, 
I know you do. I know you're here. And I know you hear. Jesus, take me to a better place. See me, Jesus, and call me. I'm, I'm waiting for you under the fig tree. And just sit there until something, until something like this happens. Song of Solomon 2.8. The voice of my beloved. Look, he comes. Leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, he stands behind our walls, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. I saw you under the fig tree. He sees us. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs. And the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. I believe Jesus is coming to you, leaping upon the mountains, bounding upon the hills. Just sit under that fig tree until he finds you. And then he's going to say, arise, my love, my fair one, come away. There's some things to come away from. I don't know what it is. The anger, the rage. We live at a time, in a moment, in a place where where there are institutions, I want to say principalities and powers, that intentionally cultivate permanent rage. It will destroy your soul. The one who leaps upon the mountains and bounds upon the hills comes to you under the fig tree and says, Arise, my love, my fair one, come away from that. It's going to ruin you. It's going to destroy you. I have a better place. Come. Come away. Come with me. Let's go. And so let me pray for you. Just receive this prayer. Lord, I pray for these that are your beloved. You see them, you love them. Lord, help them find their fig tree. Help them find the place where they can sit in your presence, where they can be open unto you. And as they sit under that fig tree and you see them, come to them, Lord Jesus. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by the Son of God. May that be so, O oh Son of God. Come to them in the winter of their discontent and say, Oh, beloved, the winter is over and the spring has come. I see you under the fig tree and I say, Arise and come away. And Lord, lead your people away from all that is ugly, all that is brutal, all that is divisive, all that is soul-destroying. And Lord, lead us into this High land, the summer land, the land, Lord, where your goodness and grace shine upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.